us uh, today, uh, Mrs. Uh, Homa Arshad, to present a talk about uh, acetabular uh, fractures for the FRCS. And this will be in the uh, combined session between the FRCS mentor group and ORUK. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Arshad is a consultant of the pelvis and vestibular lower limb provision arthroplasty as a uh, surgeon and uh, uh, the uh, clinical lead at the Royal London Hospital. Uh, we will start with the uh, lecture followed by uh, any uh, questions you want to ask. Uh, please do uh, by writing in the chat box and I will ask Mrs. Arshad at the end. Uh, also, uh, we will have uh, these questions answered uh, af just after the lecture. Uh, after that, we will go for the M MCQ poll. Uh, and uh, the answer to that is anonymous. So please participate in the MCQ. And after that, we'll uh, have a very interesting Viva uh, practice, uh, which will be not recorded. Uh, then the uh, closure. Uh, two further things that I uh, want to recommend is the concise orthopedic notes, which is a very important provision notes for the FRCS. It helped me personally for the exam and the ORUK basic science books. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, please, uh, Mrs. Arshad, can you uh, start sharing your screen and uh, present us the uh, uh, very interesting topic of acetabular fractures. Hi, good evening everybody and thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar. I'm going to talk about acetabular fractures today with a focus on the exam and um, if you can put your questions, I tend to ask questions as we go along, but you can put more questions and answers if you like into the chat. Um, and we're going to have a discussion at the end. So, uh, why can't I make this work? Okay, so these are basically the things that I want you to get to grips with that we're going to help you with the exam to um, remember that when you go into the exam, you're going to be assessed as if you are a day one consultant. And so you must be able to describe the initial management the classification worldwide that's most widely used is the Judean maternal classification for acetabular fractures. We're going to talk briefly about approaches. And um, then when you're discussing any clinical case to talk about prognosis is really helpful. And so imagine that you're presented with this case in the Viva. And obviously this is a high energy injury and it's quite unsettling to be shown something dramatic, but they will expect you to be safe and to understand the simple aspects. And so the really important distinction is between pelvic and acetabular fractures, which are often lumped together because they're in the same part of the body, they're the same surgeons who deal with them, but in the exam, they will expect you to distinguish between the two. So this, as you can see, if you look at the sacroiliac joints, the widening and injury of the right sacroiliac joint as compared to the uh, left side, which looks normal, and the obvious dislocated hip with the acetabular fracture. This fits into the injury pattern of a combined pelvic and acetabular fracture, which occurs in 15% of cases. And so that is unusual. And the other features they have in common are, um, are that these patients sometimes need resuscitation. So in terms of that, um, pelvic trauma, when it's high energy injury, these patients are frequently, uh, in need, more frequently needed of resuscitation. And you can recognize it by the fact that there is a disruption to the symphysis. There's usually ramus fractures and disruption of the sacroiliac joints. Whereas with uh, acetabular fracture, you are, if your eye is drawn to the, the socket of the hip, of the ball and socket joint of the hip, and that's disrupted, the dome is injured, the turnels lines, which we're going to talk about, are disrupted, that is an acetabular fracture. And so there are some things in common, but very important to make this really basic distinction between the two. And one useful way to think about it is if you're dealing with pelvic trauma and pelvic fractures, then your aggressive trauma surgeon side has to come out 
and you're going to use that because resuscitation of the patient is key and initial management is in some cases going to save a life. Whereas with acetabular fractures, the challenge is more around the anatomical reconstruction of that fracture. And so your Einstein side is more important because the challenge lies in the planning and surgery. And so when we talk about acetabular fractures, the column principle is what Letourneau's classification is based on. And the acetabulum is considered to be represented by an anterior column and a posterior column. Imagine you are in the exam now, and we're going to talk about initial management of an acetabular fracture. You are a day one consultant at a major trauma centre, and in the emergency department, in the resuscitation room, you are naturally going to be three rows back. You're not part of the normal assessing team, but you will be asked for your opinion. And so a patient who presents with a dislocated hip what is our approach to the initial management of that patient? The first question you'll be asked in the exam is, what is your approach to this patient? And so um, what I would suggest is not to ask questions about it. So it's natural to think, gosh, I don't know the age of the patient. I don't know the sex of the patient. I don't know the mechanism of injury. But asking questions will just irritate the examiners. So talk about what you can see. You can see the hip is dislocated. And the first thing to say is to recognize this is a surgical emergency. This is a surgical emergency requiring urgent reduction of the dislocated hip. And I will start by assessing this patient according to ATLS principles. What are you going to do next? What is the, so we've got some MCQs at the end to talk about that and to test your, your learning. But I would suggest that the most important thing at this point is once you have assessed the patient by ATLS principles to examine the neurological status and the vascular status of the limb. And then there is a need for urgent reduction and a question over where we, where we carry that out. Patient is best served by urgent reduction without delay. And so that means usually in the emergency department with appropriate sedation and personnel. And as well as assessing the neurological and vascular status, what else do you need to know about this patient? So you also need to know, you need to carry out an assessment of the limb because an attempt at close reduction, for example, in this situation would be very disappointing. And so assess the neurological status, assess the vascular status because that informs what happens immediately and what happens next and the, the, um, the implications of any deficit you have after reduction maneuver and assess the whole limb and be able to describe the maneuver. So the maneuver is a two person technique using counter traction, appropriate sedation, flexing the hip and knee to 90 degrees and applying traction. And this slide describes maneuvers with increasing um, uh, personnel and increasingly more complicated maneuvers, which I do not recommend. So we attempt it once in the emergency department with sedation and two personnel. And if that doesn't work, then we transfer the patient to theater. Now, there's a question about uh, what if the patient has an associated acetabular fracture? So if we look at the um, initial x-ray of this patient, uh, we think if we assess the whole limb that the rest of the limb is intact, but probably the most important fracture to exclude is where? The most important fracture to exclude is a fracture of the femoral neck. And I would suggest that this imaging gives you some degree of confidence there is no fracture of the femoral neck. And so you can safely perform a, a reduction maneuver. But if in doubt, then you want to carry out a CT scan. And if you suspect an associated acetabular fracture, it's good practice to carry out a CT scan to understand what you're dealing with and then carry out an attempt at closed reduction. So this is a different type of dislocation. The majority of dislocations occur with dashboard injuries and uh, are a posterior dislocation. This is an anterior dislocation. And with a posterior dislocation, the limb is shortened, internally rotated. With a, an anterior dislocation, the limb is externally rotated and the maneuver is quite different. So the leg will be in a completely different attitude and the maneuver you need to do to re relocate this is also different. You apply traction, 
but also you need to apply direct pressure to the femoral head to push it back in place. Unfortunately, the anterior wall of the acetabulum is far shallower than the posterior wall. And so this is usually straightforward. So to summarize native hip dislocation, it's a surgical emergency. If you don't think there are any fractures, then the most important initial maneuver is to assess the neurological status and the vascular status of the limb um, and carry out an urgent reduction with a CT scan if you are concerned about the femoral neck. Uh, the, uh, as long as the neck is intact, associated fractures around the acetabulum, the initial management is the same. But if you try and it won't come back closed and it won't come, you don't have, it won't come back closed even in the operating theatre or there's a delay, then you need to make sure you have the right people there or the patient is in the right environment for an open reduction, which could be with a hip surgeon familiar with the posterior approach who understands how to explore the sciatic nerve and urgent immediate transfer if necessary. So moving on to acetabular anatomy, um, the column concept is key. And so the anterior column, you can see here in green is far larger with the posterior column being a much more limited structure. And we're gonna talk about how they're represented on uh, X-rays and how to differentiate them on CT scans as well. So the, um, these lines, what are these lines called? These lines are really useful for defining the um, acetabular anatomy. They're known as Letourneau's lines and they are um, uh, represent each important anatomical part of the acetabulum. So starting with the iliopectoneal line, this represents the anterior column and you can see the anterior column here in green, a very extensive structure, including most of the ileum the anterior, superior and inferior iliac spines and the um, pubic um, symphysis. Um, and the, the, if you were to look down onto a bony pelvis, you don't see a line. The, the line is um, an overlapping condensation of cortical bone that you see on a plain x-ray. So it's important to recognize that. The ischial line represents the posterior column. Again, starting from the medial border of the ischium, going up the ileum and round to the sacroiliac joint. And the posterior column is a much more limited structure. You can see here the, the ischium and the ischial spine, the greater sciatic foramen, the lesser sciatic foramen. The radiographic teardrop is Remember, you're not going to, this is not a structure that you see looking down onto the bony acetabulum. This is a image, a representation you see on, a, on, a, on an X-ray, on an AP radiograph. And this represents the medial wall of the acetabulum. The radiographic roof represents the dome. And then the anterior rim and posterior rim represent the margins of the acetabulum. The anterior, and they can be quite difficult to see. So one tip is the anterior rim. If you follow the inferior margin of the superior pubic ramus to the edge of the acetabulum, you can pick up the, um, the anterior rim that way. And the posterior rim, if you follow the uh, lateral border of the ischium upwards, you, that picks up a line that runs into the um, posterior rim representing the border of the posterior wall of the acetabulum. And so these lines, um, Latournelle's lines, are really useful when it comes to defining what the fracture is and fracture classification. And the, the system, Latournelle system, describes five elementary and five associated patterns based on two columns and two walls. And it's, it can be, when I was a trainee, I found it quite difficult to get my head around this, but actually um, uh, uh, these, um, uh, uh, the classification can be, um, quite nicely described by um, dividing it into two groups. So if we think of posterior um, fracture dislocations, um, the elementary fractures are posterior wall, posterior column. The associated fractures are transverse posterior wall, posterior column, posterior wall. And note here that the, there is one of these associated fracture patterns, more than one fracture line, that does not cross both columns. So one of the pitfalls of answering questions on acetabular fractures is to see something that looks complex and say as a sort of reflex, this is a both column fracture. And it isn't always, it could be posterior column, posterior wall. 
pay attention to your toenails lines and you won't get caught out. Elementary anterior injuries, anterior wall, which is actually quite rare. So an anterior wall, if you see that on a CT scan or you see a report saying that, or you, you think you're seeing that, it's more often actually the root of ramus, which is right at the border of the acetabulum and represents a pelvic ring fracture. Anterior wall by itself is, is unusual. And so it's actually often a root of ramus and a pelvic ring fracture or um, rarely associated with an anterior dislocation. Uh, anterior column, uh, again, is unusual. Much more commonly, a fracture, an anterior column fracture has a posterior element to it. And the associated type is anterior column posterior hemitransverse, which is one of the very one of the, the most common um, fractures of both columns. And then we have transverse and T-shaped. So the transverse fracture is an elementary type fracture, single fracture line crossing both columns. Whereas the associated is um, a T-shaped fracture with a single fracture line crossing both columns and a second fracture passing inferiorly. So um, I must remember these images come from my colleague, Julian Cooper in Birmingham. So thank you for those. He's keen for them to be used for teaching purposes. Associated both column fractures have particular features that you can uh, pick up really easily and impress examiners with. The fracture is a complete articular fracture. So the part of the ileum, which is most posterior, is um, uh, separated. So if you look at the where the fracture lines are here, the um, acetabulum itself has no connection with the sacroiliac joint and the axial skeleton. It is completely separated by fracture lines. And as a result of that, the whole of the acetabulum tends to be displaced medially. And it occupies a position in the pelvis where it looks often like an acetabulum. You have this secondary congruence where the fracture fragments come to lie in a position around the femoral head. And we call that secondary congruence. Um, and so we'll talk about the features of associated both column fractures because it's really um, pretty straightforward. So this is an axial CT scan of an associated both column fracture. And you can see here, there's quite an extensive anterior column fracture. This is the constant fragment, follow it down. And as you follow it down, you can see that it's separate from the rest of the acetabulum. The rest of the acetabulum is medialized and there's no connection between the fracture fragments and that constant fragment that we saw higher up. So that is an associated both column fracture. And if we look at the um, uh, coronal part of the CT scan, we can see that, and often in the exam, they'll show you one or two images, but it will have the salient features on it. So we can see that the, fra the fragments of the dome and the acetabulum are quite medialized relative to the, um, oops, relative to the, um, uh, uh, constant fragment. So this is the same scan. Here's the constant fragment, posterior column. And you can see here, posterior column, there's the fracture line. And you can see the whole of the acetabulum has medialized relative to the, um, relative to the uh, constant fragment and the um, uh, posterior column and the, uh, ax the sacroiliac joint and the rest of the skeleton, the, where it, compared to where it should be, it's medialized. And it's, it's got this um, secondary congruence with um, fracture fragments just lying around the femoral head. Um, and so uh, another useful uh, feature to look out for Or is this sharp spike of ileum in x-ray, an AP x-ray or an oblique x-ray, and you'll see that sharp spike of ileum sticking out, and we call that the spur sign, and it occurs because the whole of the acetabulum is medialized relative to the, um, relative to the uh, uh, constant fragment, leaving the ileum behind. So features of an associated both column fracture, secondary congruence, medialization, and the spur sign. Okay. So what about prognosis? So you can see that this is a, this looks like a, a, a you know, acetabular fractures comes a spectrum. Some can be completely undisplaced, visible only on a CT scan. Some can be very displaced. And so, and there are different fracture patterns. So um, they vary in terms of prognosis. 
And so what do we know? Which are the fractures that are going to be most problematic? And um, when we talk about prognosis, we're talking about, we're not talking about death of the patient. We're talking about death of the hip, as in the hip ending up in a total hip replacement. So um, in terms of that, um, what do we know about who, which patients are, are likely to end up needing a hip replacement? Um, because this informs how we, how we advise them and uh, how we follow them up and uh, an understanding of what needs to happen next. And so this is, this is a, a, a historical study from Matter. There have been several since, including a recent one from Sweden, um, uh, looking at prognostic factors. But we see the same thing in every study. There are the same factors that lead to a poor prognosis. Um, and with long-term follow-up, we can tell which are the hips that are likely to survive and which are the ones that don't. And posterior wall. So is posterior wall a simple, it's a simple fracture, surely that could be a, a, a good one to have. Um, posterior wall uh, used to have a name for itself as being an easy fracture to fix because if you were a hip surgeon familiar with the posterior approach in the days before the trauma network, you could probably expose it, put it back and, and fix it. Um, but even in the hands of experts, posterior wall carries a poor prognosis. And the reason is the associated complications from surgery, including sciatic nerve injury, retrotopic ossification, and uh, the need for hip replacement because of secondary osteoarthritis. And so posterior wall carries a poor prognosis. Initial displacement, so very displaced and then there are many features here that are a feature of fragility fracture of the acetabulum that can occur at any age. So uh, the, the most, the clearest poor prognostic indicator for a patient ending in um, a hip replacement is age. The older you are, the more fragile your bone tends to be and the more difficult it will be for that hip joint to recover from a, a catastrophic injury even with an attempt at anatomical reduction. And so the other features that, that can happen at any age, but are really a feature of osteoporotic fractures or fragility fractures are femoral head damage, marginal impaction, um, incongruence, uh, and uh, difficulty achieving an anatomical reduction. But there's also something here about the extended aliofemoral approach, which we'll talk about briefly later. So what's this? Do people, have people seen this before? Do, is there, um, people have experience with, with noting this on the, on the, perhaps on the CT scan? Uh, so uh, you see it when it's very obvious on a plain x-ray, but actually a CT is needed to see this when it's more subtle. And this is the seagull sign. So the seagull sign represents serious, significant dome impaction which is basically crushing of cancellous bone as the femoral head is driven up into the acetabulum. It's a feature of acetabular, fra of acetabular fractures, fragility fractures of the acetabulum, but it can occur in any age and it's a poor prognostic sign reflecting a need often for total hip replacement surgery rather than fixation alone. Uh, and so marginal impaction, so this is the CT image and you can see um, the image on the right shows um, huge incongruency at the lower end of the screen. You can see follow the socket around the femoral head and suddenly you can see the shape of the socket, but it's been pushed back um, towards the medial wall by this impaction. And so in a young patient, what we do is elevate that impaction, uh, put a bone graft often from the great trochanter into it and try to restore the congruency, con congruency of, the, of the hip joint. Uh, this is a, 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 a surgical image. So you can see there the um, chondral bone of the acetabulum has been pushed back to a seriously non-anatomical position and left like that, this hip will have a poor prognosis. So hip replacement surgery acetabular fractures is not straightforward. Um, often uh, to, take, to take the displaced acetabular fracture and end up with a stable hip replacement requires some, to some extent, often some reduction of the fracture and there are different strategies. So to summarize that, reduction of the fracture and total hip replacement surgery or use of a cage type implant which bypasses the fracture. Those are the, the, two, uh, the two main strategies. 
Um, and this is, this is, you can see the amount of metal has been put in here. There's an anterior column plate, a medial plate, two posterior column plates, um, a modular acetabular component of the hip replacement, allowing maximal bony contact and adjustment of um, the direction of the bearing surface for maximal um, fixation and maximal stability. Um, so these are cases that are associated with a higher complication profile. Okay, approaches um, are basically anterior and posterior. And I would say really learn your approaches for the exam because they are a gift. And if you have an opportunity to talk about them, you can just run through the steps. And as long as you uh, are confident and accurate with describing, um, that will be very satisfactory to the examiners. And so the anterior approaches, um, here on the left, there's a fan and steel incision, and on the right, a midline incision, which is sometimes used in uh, da the damage control situation when pelvic packing is done. And so you occasionally find yourself in a situation where you want to do an anterior approach, and the patient's already had a midline laparotomy, and you want to use the same, same scar, same incision. So you can. The modified stopper approach is excellent for visualization of the um, whole of the um, uh, anterior column and the medial wall of the acetabulum, allowing you to access even the posterior column. So you can see here, you can get all the way back to the greater sciatic foramen, um, not to see it face on, obviously you're looking in from the front, but you can place retractors there, you can put reduction instruments there, you can uh, use all sorts of indirect reduction techniques. And so this is a very versatile approach for dealing with um, probably the majority of fractures, which are not posterior column or posterior wall. And uh, you can see that it's, um, it's quite a, uh, quite a, if you're not care, you, it's, it's, it's an approach that requires care because you're passing in a window between some major vessels. So the common iliac vessels are passing to one side. Number one here represents what? That's the inferior epigastric artery. Three uh, is the uh, branch of the internal iliac. And two is the um, uh, corona mortis. So the ilioinguinal approach will allow you to come in um, from a very different trajectory on the anterior column of the acetabulum, whereas the modified stopper approach brings you in quite medially and you will encounter the corona mortis most of the time. Um, and with um, exposing the whole of the anterior column and the whole of the medial column, it's, um, it's extremely versatile. So, uh, so this represents the ileo-inguinal approach and uh, the modified stopper approach has been described in the past as having, as using the, um, the medial window of the, of the ileo-inguinal approach. Um, the skin incision is sort of similar but actually the you come in on and your exposure is, is completely different. The maximal utility of the ileoingual approach is to see the part of the anterior column, which is directly over the hip joint. So um, if, you want to, if you want to expose that, it's unusual to need to expose that in particular, but, um, but um, uh, you, you should um, definitely be able to, ex to describe the ileoingual approach in detail because it is um, uh, a gift. If you're given it in the exam, you can score many points by just describing it accurately. Okay, so this is a deep section of a posterior approach. The posterior approach is basically the cock langebeck approach, which is the approach, same approach is used in the hip replacement, except uh, a much more extensile skin incision is often needed up to the posterior superior iliac spine or towards that area because uh, patients having this type of surgery are frequently young muscular patients with huge muscles and often also the anatomy is quite distorted. Um, the sciatic nerve is not necessarily where you expect it to be. And so a larger approach, unless you are doing um, fix and replace surgery for an acetabular fracture, if you want to see the um, uh, important structures and particularly to try and preserve the vascularity of the hip, um, a larger exposure is often necessary. And uh, the release with this red line here, you can see the release is through the short external rotators of the hip, uh, preserving the medial 
um, circumflex femoral vessel, which runs in the quadratus femoris. And so, uh, so those are the principles of the cocker langebeck approach. And there are variants of it, um, but this is basically the workhorse for posterior approaches. So other helpful approaches, variants of the posterior approach include the Gibson, which rather than going through directly through the, through the center of uh, gluteus maximus, and dividing into two, the Gibson takes an interval more anterior, so separating, going in the fascial interval between um, gluteus maximus and tensor fascia lata. So that's quite a nice approach. A GANS trochanteric osteotomy and surgical dislocation we use for a posterior approach where you want to perhaps fix a posterior column, posterior wall, but you also have a very large dome fragment and you want to see inside the acetabulum. It's also described as being useful for seeing the anterior um, margin of the acetabulum, but actually you can often get to that just by use of retractors. Uh, the Adelaide is a very extensive posterior approach and pararectus is a useful anterior approach, but I wouldn't learn any of these approaches in detail for the exam. I would focus on, um, on, on the most important, you will not be expected to know any of these, focus on the most important um, aspects which we've talked about, including the initial approach, initial management, classification, and um, uh, simple anterior and posterior approaches. And these are approaches which were more commonly used historically, are rarely used these days, don't mention them, don't go there. Extended iliofemoral approach and triradial approach both have problems, particularly bearing in mind that the ultimate uh, need for some of these patients is a total hip replacement. The extended iliofemoral approach is associated with a very high infection rate the, because you basically strip all the soft tissues off the ileum front and back. The triradiate approach crosses every approach that you might use to do a hip replacement. And so it's a bit of a nightmare faced with that um, in that situation. And so if you start talking about these approaches, they're difficult to describe and you will start digging a hole for yourself in the exam. Stay away from them would be my advice. And so these are examples of fixation at the top of the screen, anterior approach, bottom of the screen, posterior approach. And you can see with the anterior approach at the top, you can put a, a, a very long anterior column plate and a, a, a medial um, a plate, you know, directly onto the medial wall of the acetabulum to um, buttress the, um, the, the fracture um, anatomically. And uh, you can do all of this through an anterior approach, even though you'll see the posterior limb of the medial plate lies along the posterior column. And um, posterior fixation, um, I've used a number of plates to try and get some of those small plates of spring plates, which are very useful for, for very small and marginal fractures of the posterior wall. And these are column screws. So we can pass percutaneous column screws. Uh, we use column screws. The image on the uh, left of the screen is a um, butt screw, a retrograde posterior column screw used as an adjunct for a posterior column fracture with a posterior wall plate. And the image on the right of the screen for an undisplaced acetabular fracture, the indications are very limited. So polytrauma, patients who are unable to mobilize due to pain are probably the two most important indications for um, putting these. These are two um, anti-grade anterior column and posterior column screws, occasionally useful technique. Probably most often used if um, one column is undisplaced and the other needs an open approach. And rather than having to do two approaches, you could do uh, one approach and then pass a percutaneous screw to supplement your fixation. So to summarize um, acetabular fractures, um, X-ray and CT are complementary to each other. Um, the lines of the acetabulum will help you with diagnosing the problem and planning what you need to do. Marginal impaction is often quite subtle and can often only be seen on a CT scan. And so um, uh, CT scans are also useful to see loose fragments. Um, and we've talked about the predictors of a non-anatomical, um, uh, sorry, predictors of um, uh, a poor outcome resulting in total hip replacement with age being the strongest predictor.